All right, it's bourbonblog.com live. It's Nicole Austin from Cascade Hollow. She is the general manager and distiller at Cascade Hollow there in Tennessee. How's it going, Nicole? It's so good to see you. Been too long. I know. it's You've done so much since I last saw you, but it does. Uh, somehow in the whiskey world, things never feel like they were that long ago. Well, we do take the long view in this industry, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Our sense of time is a bit skewed. Yes. Oh, we, we do. We do. And so many cool things you've been doing uh, there at Dickel. And, and this is pretty exciting, this... Uh, this copper tongue, which I'm tasting, and uh, I mean, okay, so a lot of people know from Tennessee, copper tongue is a snake. Do you see many of these? Uh, yeah, so um, you know how they all, have, they all, all the orphan barrels have like a spirit animal, and right. so I got to pick this one because I was oh. picking the so they let me pick the animal, so I chose the copperhead snake. Um, because there actually are a ton of them on site at the distillery. Uh, we have like a very cute creek that runs um, kind of right through the middle of the uh, of the hollow. And it's actually um, a spring fed creek, which it's the same, the spring that we get our water from that we use to make the whiskey. Um, and there are a bunch of copperheads that live in there. And we have this like cute little sign, like beware of snakes. And when I first came to the distillery, I was like, oh, that's adorable. And they're like, no, seriously. D don't go near there. Like they, they'll kill you. I was like, oh, beware. So beware. It's. I mean, this is a, a. By the way, delicious. I just poured some. I just unboxed it. Awesome. Um, Sixteen-year-old Tennessee whiskey. Yeah. I would say a friendly flavor. But are these snakes? Are these pretty friendly snakes? Or what's the story? Um, the snakes are not that friendly. There okay. are, there's some very cute rat snakes that are around. There's some lovely friendly snakes. Um, but I think. Yeah, I, I would also agree with you that this is quite a, a friendly it's, whiskey. It's friendly. It is. And it doesn't, it doesn't have the bite or even the, I don't know how a whiskey would have a hiss. Can you tell me how a whiskey would have a hiss? Maybe uh, off of a. The barrels certainly hiss, you know, when it's hot out. And there you go. They do, don't they? do hit yeah. hiss occasionally on a day like today, especially. Was there, a, was there a second spirit animal that you had if, if, if it wasn't the. What else would it be in Tennessee? Well, I mean, obviously I was going to go for horses because that's me, you know, but I think they already did one. So, yeah, they got that um, gifted horse. Well, we've always enjoyed these. Um, these are always very limited, very delicious, very unique. Um, how'd you go about selecting this? How did you, how, how was this, how was this found as an orphan barrel? <laughs> I, it was never in fact lost. Uh, <laughs> I knew what it's I still so good that it was found though. Barrels are currently um, the way. So they, you know, they kind of called me up, right? So obviously, I don't look after the orphan barrel brand. That's you know, different folks. Um, and they called me up basically and just asked. You said, "Hey, w we might like to do one, you know, from Cascade Hollow. Like, do you have any whiskeys, you know, that would be appropriate for that?" And I do a regular review, and I had actually was not that far off of finishing a uh, really big review of all of our mature whiskey inventory. And when I'm doing that, you know, I'm, I'm tagging stuff, right? Like, Oh, this, this particular lot was interesting and it smelled interesting. And like, you know, I had, I don't make tasting notes for every single lot because there are obviously like there are thousands, but the ones that stick out, you know, you kind of tag, right? Like, Ooh, I might want to do something special with this later. So I actually had kind of my spreadsheet handy when they called me and, um, just looked at sort of some of my older whiskeys that I had like tagged and made notes for and saw that, yeah, I did have a few that I didn't currently have, you know, plans for that might be appropriate for Orphan Barrel. Um, so I told them, yes, I would. And then looked at those. And I also, um, you know, had uh, some of the existing blenders who had worked on the past Orphan Barrel at work um, to say like, hey, which ones are these are, you know, closer in to some past Orphan Barrels. Um, and we actually both picked the same two um, as our favorites. And so I did um, a blend of those two different lots. So that's how this was created. So this, again, this is a blend of two different lots of, yes. does that mean, for whiskey terms, what, is, what does that mean, just so we know? So a single lot um, is, is whiskey that was all barreled on the same day. So, and, you know, typically that would be out of one, the same tank, right? So 
you know, you can feel kind of confident that at least what went into the barrels was homogenous. Um, of course, obviously, every barrel has its own distinct characteristics that it's in parts and every barrel is a little bit different. But we tend to at least try and approximate or treat like I'll do composite samples from the lot of barrels, which, you know, might be a few hundred and you take five or six and sort of composite them together and try and work on the assumption that it's relatively homogenous. Um, and so it's those two different days um, of, of whiskey fill that I used to create this. That's excellent. And again, this is uh, this is quite limited. It's very old. Uh, do we know how limited this is? Do we know? Um, I don't know that they're saying. I do know exactly how limited it is, but I did not actually check if I'm allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we will say it's pretty limited. I mean, when you yeah, when you're mean, talking like about let's just pieces. yeah, uh, just tell me for a Tennessee whiskey, probably similar to a Kentucky whiskey. If it is 16 years old, how much is left in a barrel? Um, no, one barrel? they're about, you know, maybe 30% full still at that time. Right. Um, and ours are kind of unique in that. So something you might have noticed about this particular release is it's the first um, cask strength orphan barrel. Okay. Um, yes. they, they haven't done that before. And that was um, something that I kind of, I suggested and wanted to do because I thought this whiskey was interesting that way. Um, yeah. If you notice, although it's cast strength and 16 years old, which I think typically would lead people to expect like, you know, 140 proof, um, it's actually just under 45% um, out of yeah. the cast. And that is related to our particular maturation conditions at Cascade Hollow. Um, these barrels were all in our single story dunnage style warehouses. And they're at the bottom. And so they, they have a tendency to go down in proof over time. Um, and you can see that, you know, in this release. So I always thought that was quite interesting and it's quite unique in American whiskey. You know, like typically what you see is things that are going up in proof, um, especially in those like upper reaches. And when people tend to do old cast strength releases, like those are the ones they're going to. That's well, big, why I thought this would be a proof, barrel because it's, it's a bit unique actually. Yeah, no, this is, it's very unique. So again, the reason it is this proof, which is lower proof than some would be at cast strength is, yeah. is it just about that part of the warehouse? Is it about Cascade Hollow in general? So our, our actually our entire warehouse has that, of those single story warehouses, right? Okay. So we also have palletized warehouses, which um, have a little bit more typical profile that you would expect um, in terms of the proof changes. But in our very oldest spirits spent most of their life in these single story dining style rick houses and so holistically they they trend down over time as they group. go down yeah so the this older one's to cask at 115 proof yeah and and that's really incredible to think that you put this in at barrel strength it's i mean it is a beautiful proof it's very elegant there is a lot going on here a lot of that that old wood, that caramel. For this, it's, it's beautiful. Elegant considering its age. Yeah, no, it's, what do you think the oldest thing you have there is? As far as at the uh, distillery, how old would be the oldest thing there? I know, I know exactly how old it is. The oldest stuff I have is from 2003. 2003, so that's what, 18? Yeah. Was there much, and we know that back, uh, we're looking at the bourbon boom beginning a little uh, over a decade ago. When you think about 16 years ago, that would be what? Fifth, this was from 15, distilled in 15? Would have been, yeah. yeah. So was there, was there much being laid down as far as Tennessee bourbon? What was, be, what was being laid down and why do you think it was being laid down then? I, you know, I honestly, I wouldn't even hazard a guess. Like that was before I, funnily enough, that was before I was even in the whiskey business and it was before Diageo owned them. It's like, I don't even know what company was running the distillery at that time. I don't know. They were doing something. Whatever they were doing, it was clearly working because I like what I have. Right. No, so <laughs> good. So but, nice. You know, you it's not even representative. Like, it's hard to know. Right. You know, the barrels have been dumped over time. Like, I, you know, I don't know in all of those years before I got here, which ones did they dump? Which ones did they leave behind? You know, were they pretty homogenous when they started? Like, they're certainly quite different now. Uh, so it's it's a bit of a mystery. Yeah, that, that is, it is interesting to think about why it might have been being laid down because, again, we're looking at something that was sort of pre-bourbon boom, yeah. uh, just getting in there. Um, you started in the, I mean, you've done so much in a 
you know, fairly, let's say, relatively short career, you have done so much for so many distilleries. Uh, you st what, were, what were you doing 16 years ago? You don't mind me asking. Yeah, gosh, uh, I was working in the wastewater treatment industry. Um, right on. Okay, so and then you started in the whiskey business when? In 2010. So not too long after that. Right, now, so I, well, I, held, I held two jobs. When I say started in the whiskey business, right, that was like nights and weekends for the first right. couple. It takes a while before you can actually, you know, try and pay your Brooklyn rent with the whiskey business. That took a little while. So um, I spent a fair bit of time still doing both. Amazing. Amazing. And so as you look back, you're drinking these older whiskeys and you're thinking, all these whiskeys you've you've been a part of from New York to Ireland, uh, now yeah. in Tennessee, um, what a cool thing that you're releasing this, that you helped pick this, blended it. It is so delicious. It is, it's something we don't see tons of Tennessee bourbon that's this old, do we? No, and you don't, I mean, you don't see a lot in American whiskey that's this old. And right. I think there's a good reason for that. Besides the boom, you know, I think quite typically when you hit these like ultra aged, you know, American whiskeys, like they, they tend to lose a lot of what makes them interesting. You know, I, I think they just become very woody, you know, like very extracted and, I think we're pretty privileged at Dickel to have a those single story kind of rick houses to go in at a lower entry proof. It gives us some conditions where I think actually you can still have some really lovely and elegant spirits at this age, which I, I think is unique and worth talking about as part of why I pick these because they defy your expectations. You know, if all you did was sort of read the label and say 16 year old cast strength bourbon. I, be surprised to sip right on. and and again you've done every it's it's you've been everywhere king's county you've been in ireland you've you've done um uh dickel um tell me i'm gonna keep sipping this tell me a little bit more about what has been happening because i know a lot's been happening at cascade hollow tell me what else has been happening there i've been very busy yeah so um i have obviously spent the first few years working on um, new releases. So I did the Bottle and Bond, uh, which we just released our third iteration of that, which I'm quite excited about. Um, the first two got 94 and Whiskey of the Year, and then the second one actually got a 95 point rating from Whiskey Advocate. So no pressure, but I guess anything less than a 96 for edition three is like a total fail. Um, and then I've also been working on some more fun stuff. Um, so I have uh, a new brand that I created called Cascade Moon. Um, which is inspired by historically this distillery, Cascade Distillery, produced more than just Dickel. Um, it, there also used to be a whiskey called Cascade Pure Whiskey, um, which we don't really know hardly anything about it, which I'm sort of grateful for because rather than the burden of trying to recreate something, I can just sort of steal the brand and go and make it something fun and new. Um, and so that's my um, sort of weird whiskey exploration brand. So I've done some interesting releases with that. Um, and I've got a lot more in the hopper for those. Um, I've also, I mean, you're asking me about my aged whiskey stocks. You're going to keep seeing some of those come out pretty soon. Um, some with the Dickel name on them. So that's going to be very exciting. And then, uh, of course, I just released Dickel Bourbon. So Yes, yes. So it's so exciting. So many things that you're doing. Uh, those, those Cascade Moons. Now, are those something yeah. we can still find? Or are those... Uh, they were we, we still have some at the distillery. Um, they yeah. were only released in Tennessee, California, and Texas. Um, right. So you might find some dusties on a shelf. You never know. Um, but they are still in a couple places in Tennessee. Um, and the first one was quite fun. It was um, a blend of a 16-year-old. It was a Tennessee whiskey, or it would have been. Um, it was the 8488 mash bill, the charcoal mellowing, but it was aged in a refill cask rather than a new cask. So really interesting whiskey. I've, I've really never tasted anything like that, like a bourbon mash bill in a used barrel for a really long time. Um, so that's quite interesting. That was the basis for the first one. And then I blended it with a, a slightly younger, kind of very fruity Tennessee whiskey. And then the second Cascade Moon was a celebration of the 150th anniversary of George Dickel. Um, and that was a blend from, so the distillery started back up from a shutdown in 2003. So it had been shut down for a number of years. Right. And so they, they first restarted on these refill casks, right? And then when they finally got their sort of first load of new casks in, the first barrel, um, all the folks that worked there signed. 
So for the anniversary, I built a small blend around that barrel. Um, and a lot of the folks actually were still working there. So it was, it was nice for them to be there, you know, when the barrel they laid down was dumped and sort of a celebration of the resurrection of the distillery um, and a very cool, like we did a ceramic bottle. It was really, um, it's quite a cool, like a little artisan. Um, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's like um, the producer was amazing that made that. So that's um, that's some of the stuff I've been working on. So many great things, and and you've always just been able to take um, you know um, really really good bourbons and whiskeys and make them even better. Uh, your palate is just um, incredible. The way you blend. I mean, any when you're when you're approaching something like this, what do you, what do you really look for when you're blending? Um, whether it's this or another another project, you know what, what what goes through your mind? Yeah, I think it has to make sense for the brand, right? So for this one, you know, it, because it was an orphan barrel, I was looking for things that would defy your expectations a bit, right? So although I might have a lovely whiskey, if it meets exactly what you would expect of a sixteen-year-old bourbon, like then that's not for this. You know, I wanted something that was a bit surprising, um, and. So I was, I had two that I thought would just were really nice and would blend well together and were sort of in their prime. Right. Um, but I tend to think of like, what, what's the best expression of the whiskey and then also needs to kind of fit with the brand, right? So, you know, the bottle and bottle, like you're, you're looking to create a certain flavor profile. So it's got to fit, it's got to make sense and then also be, you know, taste nice. And distinct, yeah. I think, I, I like to show people how how much blending can really change things, even in American whiskey, because it's not often a part of the conversation, but it, it's massively impactful, you know, from a flavor and aroma delivery perspective. And people just don't talk about it that much. They tend to talk about like, oh, it's a high rye mash bill or something, so it's spicy. And I'm like, I bet I could take that mash bill and make you 20 different whiskeys, you know, <laughs> that would be completely distinct from one another you know, unrecognizable in the lineup all through blending. Um, it's something that we don't talk often about in American whiskey. So I like to surprise people in that way to kind of inspire them to talk about that part. Yes, no, and, and you really do. And people are asking about, again, notes on this. I mean, I get, to me, there's just a lot of nice creaminess. There's some good warmth, not a, not too much heat, but some heat, uh, but it's really a gentle warmth. Uh, lots of brown sugar on this. Um, lots of sugar, lots what, of where do you think that comes from? I mean, obviously we know it's old whiskey, but is that something you were going for? Is that brown sugar sweetness? That's, that's part of what makes something so sort of pleasant and approachable, which again, yeah. these of this age sometimes are not. So like to deliver something, just that sweetness that makes you want to, gives you that juiciness, want to go back into it. And then I also think the wood here expresses is like a little bit of almost more of like a citrusy cedar kind of wood expression. Yes. Yeah. And, so I really like that as well because it's a little surprising and not just that typical sort of like oak, you know, like just tannic oak. It's like a little brighter. Um, and I, I would also call this whiskey almost a bit um, like citrusy floral. Yeah, there's some of that nice citrus floral. The nose is um, mm -hmm. has a lot happening. A lot of really elegant sugars on this. Thank you. Um, yeah, and again, can people find this now or is it about to be found? Um, yeah, so it, it is on shelf now. Um, it's yeah. first day's timing is a bit different, um, but if you are interested, start your hunt soon. Search for that. It's a hundred dollars a bottle. Uh, some of the orphan barrels, you know, state by state, maybe. Um, yeah, a little bit more. Just all depends. But this is yes, this I is, don't control um, that part. <laughs> no, it's not Nicole's fault. <laughs> Uh, it's Nicole's fault that it's good. <laughs> but... at me if you're if it's like <laughs> What's your? I mean, obviously you have access to a little of that older whiskey there, um, uh, and it's uh, it is delicious. But Thank what's you. your go-to from your collection? What are you really enjoying tasting now? Um, oh man, I'm drinking the bourbon. Um, drinking a lot of the bourbon. I'm drinking right the Dickel bourbon. That's like my go-to. I guess that's the privilege of being a blender. You can make the kind of whiskey that you love to drink. So. Right. Right. <laughs> I can keep my own bar well stocked. So the Dickel bourbon, uh, yes. you do it. Do you do you like doing it in cocktails? Do you have any in Nicole Austin specialty cocktails? I do like to do cocktails, actually. Um, I mean, I often just drink it neat, but um, it, you know, an old fashioned, right? The the uh, when you're a distiller and you don't actually know that much about how to make good cocktails, the unscrew up a bowl, you know, <laughs> is. A really nice place to go. It's like, oh, just a bit sugar, a bit bitters, like, and it's a cocktail. 
it's a, it's a miracle. It is. They can. We've, we've gotten better and better at them here in the last thirteen or how many even months it's been. Uh, no, this is this is delicious, delicious stuff. Yeah. The copper tongue again, named after yeah. uh, the snakes. Uh, any, 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 yeah. Any great stories? Uh, that, any, uh, obviously, you see these. Any good stories you've had with any snakes that you um, want to tell? I, so I have the the most distinct stories that I've heard tell. I thankfully was not around to witness, um, but we did used to have a distiller um, by the name of Randy, who was a real character. Um, he had like a Santa Claus beard, uh, 100% could easily be mistaken for Santa Claus. He was such a jovial character. He drove, fun fact, a bright pink smart car. So he's got this like big guy with this big Santa Claus beard driving a tiny pink car. He's just a real character. But when they would come around, like he used to just go and freaking grab them, you know, and like pick them up. <laughs> I've heard many I've heard many a story, particularly from our safety officer, who was like, "Yeah, no, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> like, no, I'm here. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, you are no longer allowed to go grab the snakes." And everyone who worked there had sort of be instructed that no, <laughs> they were not allowed to go pick up the poisonous snakes. Um, so can't that's do that anymore. <laughs> well, we 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 have the copper tongue. Uh, it's probably maybe as as close as some of us want to get to one. Uh, sip on age sixteen years. Cast strength, but again, cast strength in this case is about ninety, almost yeah. ninety proof. It's just yeah, it's just under ninety proof. Under sure. ninety proof. Uh, you have your bourbon coming. We'll we'll try that soon. You have other yeah. other new. There'll be some other old old releases from Dickel. Yes. So I've got the next two Cascade Moons planned. Both should mm -hmm. be fun surprises. Um, and then I've got some old, some other old whiskey um, that I'm working on for a Dickel. Okay. The old whiskey will be under the Dickel name and we might even see it maybe even older than this. Maybe. Or as, never maybe as old. You never know. You might. It's going to be old though. We know it's going to be something good and tasty. Uh, you, uh, I know you do a lot of work there, but any able to rejoice. I can't wait. I can't wait to try it. Uh, mm -hmm. Any, any play, Are you going to be at any whiskey festivals, events, any place we're going to see you? You know, I don't know. Uh, it's. I think we're doing a bourbon launch party in LA um, at some point in August. Oh. Uh, I, you know, other than that, it's weird. Uh, like readjusting the to the idea of like being on a schedule and going places again is it, quite odd. And yeah. uh, you know, I think for a lot of us in the whiskey world, I'm very cautious of preserving my sense of smell um because right. oh crazy. yeah that would stop one bit so yeah i think, I think it's gonna be a bit of a slow re-emergence yeah. me but we'll see well we hope we see you some i hope i'll try to get down there sometime we're not too too far away from you i'll try to get that. down there you should come please. visit you're welcome thank anytime you. thank you no i would love to come see you and try some more great stuff and again uh so many good people. If you have any questions uh, for Nicole, ask away. It's Bourbon Blog Live. We're going to keep this up permanently wherever you're watching it. We'll also put it on our um, on our podcast channel. And uh, thanks, thanks for the chance to uh, to try this uh, with you, Nicole. You're yeah, so it's really it's really good to see. It's really delicious stuff, and I know much more delicious stuff to come there from Cascade Hollow, uh, Tennessee. Obviously, the Tennessee Whiskey Trail. Are you seeing more and more people coming back to visit? What's yeah, that like? very much so. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. It's, I think people are really appreciative right now of those sort of, um, you know, reachable, um, you know, excursions. So, and we've got a lot going on around here. You know, of course, Uncle Nearest just opened. Yes. Uh, we've got Jack so Daniels, amazing. The Harvester Center. There's a lot, you know, within 20 minute drive of each other. So, yes, yeah, that's only, it's only how far away from you? They're about 20 minutes. Oh, wow. They're, they're okay. Quite close, so you could really hit all three in a day quite easily. Oh, and then you, and then who else is only 20 minutes away? Um, Uncle Nearest, Jack, and, and Dickel are all quite close to one another. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think for, I mean, obviously, always there's been so many great distilleries, but as far as now that there is this push for tourism at the last few years with the trail, what are your thoughts? How's it, how's it helped? I'm thrilled. I mean, I think, you know, I can get on all the podcasts and do all the interviews, but really, you know, there's nothing better than standing in the place to really understand what it's about. And, yeah. you know, no words need to be said. You can just kind of get it by standing there. And I think people really value that. You know, so you just get a lot of insight. It's, you learn interesting things, you know, little nuggets. You stand in a place. It's, just an, it's an experience that can't be duplicated. 
you know, it's, I think it's worth pursuing. I've learned a lot visiting distilleries. Yes. Oh, me too. And I love what's happening in Tennessee. So many. There's like how many in Tennessee? 30? 50 now. Yeah. More than 50. Yeah. 50 yeah. lots. Fair few. All right. We do have a lot of, um, we do this weekly cigar show called Cigar Saturday. So we have a lot of cigar fans. We do have a question from one of our, are you a cigar fan? It's a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I do like a good cigar. What do you like to, uh, what, what do you like to pair with what? What would be one of your favorites? Oh my God. I don't know enough about them to have an opinion on that. I do like to be told. I like cigars are an area where I like someone else to tell me. <laughs> what I should be enjoying. Um, I particularly, I like the, I like them when they're a little narrower. I don't like like a giant honker um, of a fat cigar. And I like them when they're, I like the leathery notes. You like the leathery notes? I really okay. like the sort of leathery detail. And you like the more thin ones, not the real thick ones. Got it. All right. So I'm going to come up with something we'll do. Well, maybe we'll get you. Sophisticated uh, cigar love. Leathery and not massively thick. <laughs> okay, I like it. We will. What we'll do at some point, we'll get you on our uh, cigar Saturday, and we'll we'll try to pair up something with one of your bourbons. How's that sound? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've got some big flavors in our old whiskeys, so I oh, could yeah. see them holding up. Absolutely. And thanks, Brian, for uh, asking that question. It's it's nice to. Uh, it is, there's some you know, and understandably, there's some distillers that um, that like cigars, and there's some that don't. But that's cool that you do. That's great. I do, yeah. It's you know, it's not something I commonly do because, like again, like I said, I don't often enjoy them at home. But I got quite spoiled when I was in New York. You know, we had like Club Macanudo. Yeah, and, so many uh, good ones. Yeah, you know, like it's I could something would be brought to me and prepared for me, and I got very spoiled. I really liked that experience. There's some great places there. Uh, yes, I completely agree. Cool stuff. Well, we'll do more yeah. with you, uh, Nicole. We'll, we'll get you on the cigar show. We'll try some of your Dickel bourbon, and hopefully, we'll come uh, see you soon. Th again, copper, uh, copper tongue, sixteen-year-old on the shelf now. Right. Try it out um, and uh, get it while it's out there because it is limited. It is quite yes. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. It was really nice to see you. Hey, Nicole, what a fun time to see you too. I used to see you at the competitions and everything, and it's, I mean, yeah. it hasn't worked that long ago, but then I realized I'm like, it hasn't been a little while. So. Years. Yeah, years. Yeah, I know. I'm crazy. Time flies. I'm it. so glad to see you, and thanks everybody for watching. Like this, share this, follow us. We'll keep this video up and uh, hit, the, hit up the Kentucky, or not the Kentucky, I'm sorry, the Tennessee. Not hit up the Kentucky the, one, but hit up the Tennessee it's because. It's distilleries in all the yeah. states. Well, That's let me great. tell you, there's Tom's more state distilleries state. on your trail, which I think is yes. pretty cool. So yes. hit that up or just visit distilleries wherever you are. Yeah. Visit all of them in all visit the Visit all of them. Absolutely. Where, are, you, are there any that you're planning on going to you haven't been to yet that you really um, want to get to? Yeah, actually, um, I feel like every time I go home to New York, there's like 10 more that cropped up that, uh, you know, it's my home state. Like, I feel like I should. Oh, yeah. Them. So... There's always new ones popping up. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nicole. Great to see you and cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Delicious stuff. Thank you so much.